sacred silt crackles and quakes as they lower into their final round. Rosie is anxious to get out of the direct line of fire, since leaving herself exposed in the beginning snowballed to her loss in the previous round. Even I can tell this, as she's poised to dash before she even touches the ring. Meanwhile, Yogev is perfectly neutral, likely considering Rosie's speed before he prepares a projectile, mindful to keep his arms to his sides so as to avoid telegraphing which particular one he's going to use. The first drum beat strikes, and the match begins with Yogev firing a ball towards where Rosie is dashing. The ball collides with Rosie and interrupts her movement, but not her aggression. Rosie retaliates with a disc, hurtled too quickly to parry, and Yogev takes the hit. The disc doesn't break Yogev's focus, so he has another ball prepared while Rosie moves to her left. Yogev sends the ball her way, but she returns it to the ground before skidding it across to break his footing. Yogev was prepared to handle the ball coming back and sidesteps it, but another disc comes whizzing faster than before and strikes the plating protecting his ribs. Thanks to his engaged core and the disc's high speed, the second it makes contact, it crumbles into dust. To maintain visuals, Yogev moves towards Rosie. Rosie keeps her cool and takes a half step back to avoid being upended, and thankfully so. Between them is now a massive wall, which after a mere second of being conjured is broiling with seismic energy. One of them made it explosive, so they both decide to disengage and find a new angle. Rosie, content to destroy the wall and hopefully push Yogev around, creates a cube and skids it along the ground to break the stationary wall. It collides and erupts into sand, in the process pushing Rosie back. However, Yogev comes from above the wall with a prepared cube and a hold, sticking his landing by bringing his cube down on Rosie. Rosie, still recovering from her follow-through destroying the wall and destabilized by the consequent explosion, doesn't have an answer for the aerial assault, and takes the hit. Now, close to the edge, Rosie has no choice but to make cover to protect herself from any more projectiles. Her first attempt is rushed and fails to conjure anything. I can tell from my second row seat that she was on her toes, deliberating with her instinct to run. She redoubles and plants her feet before making a second attempt to create cover, but it's too late. As her wall comes up from the silt, a tumbling cube crackling with more explosive energy shatters upon impact and blows Rosie away. Her footing let her reach for the ring, but she was knocked too far back to grab the edge. She lands in the pit around the ring, and the patrons in front of me all lean over to see her. Bill, the spectator, brings her back up to the ring with a large column. Rosie and Yogev touch knuckles while Bill descends from his observation platform and grabs their wrists to confirm the victor. The title of Bustlem Rumble Champion goes to... He pauses briefly, looking at the two competitors, before raising one of their arms and declaring, Yogev! And the crowd goes wild. Rosie and Yogev are both in tears. In no more than six months, they've gone from sickly outcasts to friendly rivals, competing to the thunderous applause of those who initially wouldn't give them a chance. In no more than six months, they've made for themselves a place where they can be who they are. And it's beautiful. After Bill lets go of their wrists, they hug tightly, pat each other on the back, break away, and bow. Bill then gestures and attracts everyone's attention again, continuing with, and before everyone leaves tonight, I offer my greatest gratitude for each and every one of you here. It's thanks to you that we can continue to rumble without fear of hunger or paucity. Have a wonderful night. While some continue their cheering and stand in ovation, others are content to see themselves out with Bill's conclusion. It's hard to see over the front row patrons what happens next, as the boys who bought those seats are very tall, but I think Yogev and Rosie hug again? As the audience dies down and files out, I hear Skylar next to me say, Ah, oh, shit. What? I ask, not entirely sure what there is to be upset about. I lost my bet, he says, dejectedly, filling an arm to hook the air. What do you mean, we're not allowed to bet, I say. He gives me a sly glance as he runs a hand against his brown hair to pull it out of his eyes. We're not allowed to bet money, he corrects. I bet Yogev that he'd lose to a girl eventually before becoming champion, and I was hoping this would be the match, but instead... <sighs> I owe him my vegetables for the next week or two. That's a stupid thing to bet on, I bleat with narrow eyes. He's impassive with his retort, claiming, What do you mean? It's a 50-50. That's like prime betting material. Or are you too prim and above it all to gamble? I... gamble? I manage, trying to remember the last time I've done something as stupid as this. Just not with food. Ah, it's alright. I'm pretty tight with Kaswan, so he'll probably make me extra portions. 
Skylar says with a snicker and a smirk. We file out of the rumbler section of the arena, my hands to my sides and one of Skylar's to his neck, wringing it like a towel. Everyone at Sanctuary files into the gondola that takes us away from the public arena into our quarters and the mess hall. All, except, for Bill. Has anyone seen Bill? I ask into the crowd. Rosie speaks up, offering, I lost track of him after leaving through the prep area. Maybe he's there tidying up? That's likely, Yogev confirms. That miserly old coot looked just about ready to fall over. Okay, thanks. You guys go ahead. I'm gonna go check in on him, I assert, stepping off the platform. I'll go with you, Rosie offers. Just then, her stomach grumbles something fierce. I look at the black belt on her tummy, and then to her before saying, You really don't have to go if you don't want to. She takes a beat to affirm that she really does want to go, but her stomach vetoes the decision, growling in protest. Okay, thank you, she exhales as she puts her body weight on the ratchet that sends the gondola along the cable. Once a few other hands jet out of the carriage and wave goodbye, I set out to find Bill. I start at the arena, as I know that large amounts of people tend to bring with them large amounts of garbage, and the turnout for the title match was the largest attendance yet. Typically, the losers of a bracket are tasked with cleaning the arena. But with just one match and one loser, I imagine Bill didn't want to add a low note to such an electrifying day. But he's nowhere to be seen, and discarded packages for snacks and confectionery are lining the rows I've been hopping over. I make it to the innermost ring, where the drums, scoreboard, and Bill's podium are accessible, as well as the prime audience seats Bill charges a premium for that those tall guys bought. Hmm. <laughs> I don't quite know how to make the connecting platforms or perform jumps that most of the people at Sanctuary do to enter the ring, but the podium itself is tall enough for me to drop down into. I do this because the ring still has a path to the prep area where Yogev and Rosie were doing their stretches before the match, and the path they took with Bill to get out of the arena afterwards. Once I'm walking into the prep area, I'm peering around lockers and benches to see if I can spot Bill. I'm instead greeted with a writhing heap planted against the wall, groaning. I recognize the white hair, so I meekly call out, Bill? Oh, it jumps with a start, rotating and unfurling to face me. Annabelle, don't startle me like that. <laughs> I giggle at the thought of me intimidating someone so remarkably tall and imposing, but looks are deceiving with Bill which makes it all the more curious that he was crumpled in the corner. Sorry, I apologize while taking a seat at a nearby bench. Bill sits on the opposite end after I get comfortable. Is everything all right? You don't look too good. Today was just a lot, he seeds. But wasn't there just one match? A lot of people, I mean, he clarifies. A lot of uh, commotion, emotional commotion. Hadn't prepared myself for all that. Maybe you should hire an MC, I offer, jokingly. Hmm. That's not a horrible idea, Bill admits, reclining into the bench and resting the length of one of his long legs on the distance between us. It's a joke. We're still broke, aren't we? Hmm. You've given me a lot to think about, Bill says, going over our food expenses in his head, divining where a master of ceremony's salary can be extracted. I sit in that moment with him, watching his lips pronounce figures as he tries to get an abstract on the logistics of creating a treasury. He eventually comes to a conclusion, exemplified by a private grunt and a furtively disappointed guise. Are you joining us for dinner? I ask once he's set the mental math aside. I was hoping you could offer a few words. Maybe tell us what's next for us? Again, you've given me a lot to think about, Bill responds. His back slips a bit further until his boot touches my thigh for a brief moment. He retracts it quickly, but I instead get up so he can continue to sprawl. Take your time, I assure him, but try to be there before the food gets cold. We'd all appreciate it. Of course, Bill agrees. But until then... <sighs> Bill practically sinks into the bench, now lying on it with both feet up, waving me away with one final bereft groan. I wave, say my farewells, and head through the rest of the prep area to loop back to the gondola. Ugh, of course the boys are fighting. I part the fabric entry to the mess hall and see Yogev and Skylar arguing about their stupid vegetables. These are my spoils of conquest, fair and square, Yogev claims with a heap of oiled broccoli on a fork. He then weaves that fork between Skylar's protesting hands to grab a carrot wedge from Skylar's plate, which is simply running over with the vegetables. 
Yeah, it was implied when we made the deal that you would get an extra portion of vegetables from me, not all that I had, Skylar argues, grabbing Yogev's wrist and struggling the carrot wedge on the fork between his teeth. Yogev musters enough strength to retract it before Skylar reclaims any calories. What sense does that make? When you said, I bet you all my vegetables, that meant all the vegetables you'd get for a week. D does anyone disagree with me? I for one disagree with your logic, Skylar insists to Yogev's chagrin. Anyone else? Yogev goads. I think he's got a point, Emma, a green belt rumbler, says. Yogev isn't surprised that Skylar's yuppie spoke up for him, but is so confident that her perspective won't be salient that he silently humors her. Tonight's the first night that anyone's gotten a double portion of vegetables, right? I'd argue that at the time the bet was made, one portion of vegetables is all that Yogev could expect. So one portion you get, Yogev. Please stop fighting. While what Emma said was the same argument Skylar was using, laying it out in a more logical, rhetorical way without any personal investment made it harder to deconstruct in good faith. Emma wasn't done sharing her thoughts, however, saying, And while I disagree with the premise, as the bet was vaguely sexist, a bet is a bet, and I'm willing to disregard whatever it was over if it means we get to celebrate while we eat instead of shouting at each other. Skylar doesn't know how to take a good thing quietly, so he turns on Emma and says, How is it sexist? It's a coin flip. There are four more men than there are women in Sanctuary, she says. Not a coin flip. Bill doesn't count, Skylar responds. Three, then, Emma relents. Not a coin flip. Skylar thinks earnestly about the population of Sanctuary for a moment and idly pinches a Brussels sprout before eating it and stroking his chin. After wiping his fingers off, he pushes the plate towards Yogev and gestures towards it. Yogev takes half. Thank you, I see as I walk between the tables towards Gaswan in his kitchen. When I pull up and get my meal, I strike up some small talk with him. Why did you give Skylar extra veggies? Uh, I knew it was throwing oil on a flame, Gaswan defended, but Skylar got me where he'd never gotten me before. He knew I'd find it funny. Gaswan sass helps turn the scoop that puts mashed potatoes on my plate. He just kept saying, just sit back and watch, and I know I'm right, and you love drama, don't you? Ugh, crafty bastard, he knows I live for stuff like this. Well, that's fine, I consider, but don't give him extra veggies for being an asshole. That mixes up the messages. Yeah, you're right, he says, chuckling. It's out of my system now. No more extra veggies, I say, offering a pinky. No more extra veggies, he agrees, locking his with mine. No wonder they were fighting over these things. Each bite of broccoli and carrot brings with it a comforting, savory wash, with the occasional zap of salt making it that much more homely. Kaswan's vegetables also have quite the kick to them, a spicy heat subtle enough to ignore if you can't handle hot foods, but tastefully present for those who'd appreciate it. The mashed potatoes also have nice flavoring, but with a much greater herbal focus. I can taste the pungence of the star of the show, garlic, but it's soothed by the warm presence of butter and small ringlets of green onion. Simple, yet effective, and I can't get enough. Oh, and then there's the salmon, laid upon the most fluffy bed of rice I've ever seen, steaming even after several minutes of waiting for me to return from the gondola. I politely introduce my fork to the underside of the fish and see another cloud of steam escape from under. I examine the salmon, whose gills are packed in with seasoning I'm not able to identify, and find the near-microscopic beads of condensation gathering under it dazzling. While the food is beautiful, and I'm eager to dig in, my brain still is caught up on something. Initially, I think it's Bill, because in spite of the few meals I've shared with everyone here, I've always enjoyed his presence in the mess hall, even if it's mostly when he reigns in on the rowdy dinner conversations that seem to be the norm here. But the food is literally steaming. He'll be able to enjoy it. So that's not it. I think about how I got here, whisked away by my father with a few heirlooms and a note. Part of me thought he'd sold me to a cult, and while I've held on to that suspicion, the only thing that's truly keeping me here is my struggle to figure out the point to all of it. I remember taking a peek at the note my father wrote for Bill when he first sent me, and how it mentioned my grandfather, the one I never got to meet. Apparently, my grandfather and Bill fought in the war together, but my father never talked to me about it. Finding that out on the train ride to the mountains was quite the shock, as my father had always been quite the patriot. You gonna eat that? A voice asks. I look across from me and find Vesper, a stocky blue belt rumbler who happens to be my roommate. I mean, 
I'd like to. I burble on my way out of my thoughts. I'll split it with you if that's too much, she bargains with a smile. I plan on eating the whole thing, I state as a matter of fact. Her smile fades, and she resumes her conversation with the person next to her, who I think is named Molly? Maxine? Something like that. I take that as my cue to dig into my food and don't regret it. The salmon that spawn in the river through the valley of these mountains must be eating good as well, because this is the fattiest, most delectable fish I've had yet. Supposedly, Gaswan and Rosie fish these up for tonight, and I can't be more thankful because they are absolutely exceptional. After a few minutes, I consider licking my plate clean. While everyone else has finished their meals, they've continued to socialize in the mess hall, and I decide I'd rather not gather an audience, a rationalization I wish Skylar could take to heart. <sighs> Bill still hasn't shown up. Hey, Gaswan? I ask, walking back up to the kitchen where he's tidying up. I spot one last plate of food that seems to be in the eye of his sanitization storm. Have you eaten? Don't tell any professionals, but I was eating while I cooked, he admits with a hushed demeanor. Your secret's safe with me, I say, because judging by how that food tasted, the smell would be too tempting for me to wait. <laughs> yeah, you get it, he chirps. Then is that last plate for Bill? I ask, pointing around the large stone cookware he's been nursing. When he shows up, he responds. Do you mind if I take it to him? You aren't trying to pull a Skyla, are you? <laughs> no, I'd like to think I'd be more... quiet, I decide. You got that right, he agrees. You happen to know where he is? Yeah, I, I spoke with him before getting my meal. He... Hmm. I stop myself as I revisit how he looked recovering from being the center of attention for so long, all crumpled up and fetal. Hopefully it gets easier for him. He's pretty torn up after organizing everything, so he wanted to sit for a bit before joining us. I'm afraid he still hasn't gotten up. Okay, well as long as you promise not to touch any of his food, I trust you to deliver it to him. Gaswan grants, pulling a tray out of the sink and rinsing off a few sides. He delicately places the meal atop the tray and presents it to me. When I reach for it, though, he places his hands on mine and says, Maybe it's best you take the back exit on account of all the <laughs> spirited portioning debates tonight. The first thing I hear is the wrinkling of paper. Bill is waddling through one of the middle rows and kicking garbage out of the seats, occasionally warping the stone to make room for his large hands when he bends down and picks more stubborn rubbish out from under the chairs. He jostles, inches at a time, cleaning under about four seats, before I clear my throat and to get his attention. He looks up at me, his white hair still swaying for a moment longer, before he shifts his footing and addresses me. You didn't have to do that, he says, gesturing towards his meal. And you don't have to do that, I reply, nodding towards the garbage heap at the bottom of the ring he's been sweeping. He looks at the pile as well, and smiles. I like you, Annabelle. I decide not to comment and instead sit next to him once he finds a seat he likes. He's just a bit too tall to recline and get comfortable, so the seating area warps more as the raked seats in front of us generously provide comfier legroom. Ugh, once I start rumbling myself, I'll have to get him to teach me how to do that. I decide that'll be my first question. Once he's swallowed a bite of those delectable vegetables, I ask, when will I start training? He takes his time to respond, working some rice with salmon into his mouth and truly savoring it. Then his mouth opens to speak. I typically teach in groups of four, he provides, vocalizing in such a way that I detect both guilt and frustration. In a frenzied moment, I consider if me asking this was rude or impatient and if that's why he's frustrated, but I table that anxiety to let him finish his thoughts instead. But I will say that very few people here have joined lately. I'm not entirely sure why. He reaches for the mug of water I struggled to keep balanced on the gondola and drinks from it before elaborating. You've been here for, <laughs> what, a month? Just about, yes, I confirm quietly. So from the beginning of the tournament to the end? That's correct. <laughs> then it's no wonder I couldn't make time for you, Bill determines with morose finality. I hang on to that note and the concern from before bubbles up. Uh, but you'll be able to teach me now, right? Now that all of that's out of the way? Bill doesn't answer me directly, instead deciding to comment on the meal he's having. 
The salmon is incredible, isn't it? I don't respond because I fail to see what he's getting at. There's a reason we don't eat like this every day. The river beneath us is hardly enough to water the plants. The salmon beneath us are hardly enough to feed us for a month. While we can celebrate every once in a while, as things stand, sanctuary isn't sustainable on its own. Not, mm. not without its matches, I add in metered mimicry. We've had this conversation before. I know that the money raised by selling seats is what keeps us fed, which I thought was the reason Swan splurged so much on the meals. <laughs> well, that and the festivity of it all. I say this to say I've been spending a great deal of time organizing the rumbles. They have to continue for a long time if I'm going to keep everyone here healthy. But we've completed an entire tournament. Are things not set up to be easier in the future? Bill takes another bite of his salmon and scratches at his chin, a firm, scritching sound escaping from his gruff. I want to provide refuge for more than just the citizens of Boslem, he concludes solemnly. I think about it for a moment, but things stop making sense pretty quickly. How does that work? I ask. Sanctuary is found upon faith. My faith, Bill starts. Faith that the spirit in the mountain wishes us to honor our accord. Faith that rumbles... And sharing our burdens, our incompetencies, and most importantly, our victories, is a responsibility that we all share. Faith that the itch is proof that I'm right, that our suffering is in our control. Bill looks across the arena and follows the peaks that expand before us to spot our small installations that work their way to the peak. Flames snuffed out one by one as people retire to their dorms to rest. Now that it's grown dark, Bill continues. The faith that Sanctuary is built upon grants it legal status as a religious refuge. Any rumblers who come here to practice are free to stay, protected from any punitive actions of this or any other nation. I negotiated very hard for that clause, and seeing the success here tonight has proven to me that it can be done. That more can be saved. Bill then looks at me, eyes wet. It's important that I continue what I'm doing here. For the sake of everyone here and beyond. So, when can we start? I press. That's the thing, Annabelle, he relents. Uh, I can't be the one to teach you. I hadn't realized I leaned towards him while he spoke about his vision for sanctuary, but I recline back into the seat with a thud when he says he can't teach me. You what? I, I, I can't be the one to teach you. No, I abscond, getting to my feet with a start. No, no, no. My father did not kick me out of his home with not but a chest of trinkets and a scrap of directions to find you, only for me to be swept in the throes of a dubiously legal cult sport and not even be given the time of day by the one person I've been told to trust. Bill is taken aback. Not hurt, but shocked. He sets aside what's left of his meal to collect his thoughts, but I'm storming out of the arena by the time he shouts my name with a measure of delicacy. Annabelle, I'm sorry things didn't work out as you'd expected. Things are very messy here, and for that I am to blame. My work here is important, but your presence is too. I can't explain why, not now, but your father wouldn't have implored me to insist you stay if it wasn't in your best interest. Well, my note read very differently. I spit over my shoulder. As it claimed you'd tell me everything if I asked. Very transparent you are. I continue up the steps of the arena and make for the exit. I've been as honest with you as I can, Annabelle. I understand you're frustrated, but please stay. Bill doesn't follow as I take the gondola back up to the residency area. When I poke my head into the dorm, Vesper is already fast asleep, hardly stirred by the storming of my stomps. In the thin darkness... I reach under my cot and retrieve my bag. Tucked away in a thin pocket is the list of directions my father gave me before he sent me here, and on the other side, his note. I step outside with it, and the glossy sheen of the dried ink basks in the light of the gibbous moon, making it possible to pour over its message. Bill is a good man. It's important that you speak to him about your incident, as he will return in kind his guidance. These things I've collected are of priceless value to him, and now is the best time for you to deliver them. You've always been my beloved daughter, Annabelle, and I want you to be safe above all else. I love you, dearly, as does your mother. I'll make a greater effort to look after her now that you're gone. Don't worry about us. We'll be fine. And I know that, whatever happens, you'll find a way to thrive. 
Go, and be great. Your loving father. I reread the last section again. Whatever happens, you'll find a way to thrive. <sighs> Perhaps he's right. I'm not like everyone else here. I can move the earth, but I don't have the itch like everyone else. If I were to leave today and never shake the ground again, I'd be fine and never lose a wink of sleep. But anyone else here would struggle to find rest or keep a meal down within the week. Even if I don't start training, I'll be fine. But considering all I've gone through, is that enough for me? If I'm not going to be doing anything, in what way does my presence here aid anyone? Considering how much Bill has lamented food expenses, wouldn't dropping another mouth to feed be a welcome opportunity? <sighs> Whatever the reason is, Bill refuses to share. I look to the moon, and a frigid air blows my braids and bag around. In this bag is everything I have left. A pittance of pocket change, a spare set of dirty clothes, a map of the bustling train network, and some lint. I know it's not enough to leave, but I make my way to the gondolas regardless. I interact with the ratchet to bring the carriage up, but as the door opens, I falter. Please stay. I hear, over and over. Please stay. Please stay. Please. I take one step backwards, and then another. My hand, grasping the note in my bag, tightens as I take a third. I spin on my heel, head low, and return to my dorm. <laughs> I stir for a while before I open my eyes. Vesper failed to wake me up by calling my name and jostling my shoulders, so she gave up on rousing me to instead get her stretches in early. Voraciously, she begins grunting and wheezing as she familiarizes herself with her physical limits, only to recklessly press against them. She can't perform a split comfortably, but she's dead set on doing so anyway, which prompts me to burble at her when she's about to hurt herself. I vocalize... something, and it's enough to grab her attention and break her focus. After she falls out of her near split and has her back to the ground, she sheepishly kneads her hamstrings and asks, What? I take some time to respond, as it's difficult for me to translate my concern into words when I'm working against my morning grogginess. Don't... Uh, hurt yourself, I guess? I manage. Oh, I'll be f- Ah! She assures while rolling her shoulders, in doing so, pulling a muscle. What did I say? I hazard. Don't hurt yourself, she repeats while struggling to find an angle to soothe her new knot with. I get vertical in my cot and invite her in front of me while she points out where on her back I'll be able to find the injured tendon. After a bit of feeling around, I identify the injury when Vesper flinches at my touch. Then, I more delicately tease it as I begin easing it back into order, strictly adhering to what I can remember of Vesper's instructions in the past. You've got to stop doing this, Vesper, I complain as I run my thumb across the knot. I feel Vesper's diaphragm oscillate as she swallows a seething curse before returning with, But how else am I going to get better at rumbling? Perhaps a regimen, I offer, instead of just doing whatever feels tough. Yeah, but that's boring, Vesper bleats. Is training with Bill boring? I ask out of genuine curiosity. The reminder that I'm the only one here who has literally zero experience occupies my headspace, and I ease up on Vesper's back. Afraid she's losing me, she leans further into me to remind me that I'm massaging her back, but when I commit to it again, I add too much pressure, and Vesper yelps. Ow! Remember what I told you about your palms? Yeah, yeah, more even pressure and control and all that. Then please don't hurt me again, she cries, amplifying her discomfort to vocalize dramatic faux sobs. I won't, it's just... I swap to using my palms as Vesper relaxes back into them, but my recollection of last night creeps in again. The gondola. How I almost left. Whether it was guilt or curiosity that kept me from doing so. How useless I felt. How upset I am. You okay? Vesper asks quietly. I must have stopped massaging her because I hadn't noticed that she'd turned to face me. No, I admit. Last night was really rough. Really? I thought you made like a bandit swindling that last meal out of Gaswan. 
Meanwhile, Skylar couldn't get an extra portion of vegetables without pissing off at least two people and making a whole show out of it. So, how'd you do it? Did you sweet-talk this one into it? I didn't take you for a flirt, Annabelle. I'm not a flirt, I assert, and the food wasn't for me. It, it was for Bill. Vesper looks a little confused with the mention of Bill, so I clarify, he cleaned the arena so Rosie wouldn't have to? <laughs> oh yeah, Bill didn't eat with us, did he? <laughs> I forgot. When I brought him his food, we talked for a little while, I resume. About what? Well, a lot of things, Vesper, I think to myself. I reluctantly mention what had the greatest presence in my mind and say, about my place here. Really? I didn't like what he had to say. Is he kicking you out? She asked with a flare of fear, indicating concern that her private masseuse is being taken away. Quite the opposite. Whew! Vesper revels briefly before puzzling over it for another moment. Wait, then what's there to be upset about? Bill said he can't teach me how to rumble. Whoa, Vesper comments. Why? Said he's busy in just about the most cryptic and operatic way possible, I lament. <laughs> yeah, he's a stoic old stooge, Vesper empathizes. Vesper looks up and puts a hand on my knee before asking, Were you thinking about leaving? I think about it every once in a while. That sentiment floats in the air unchallenged for an uncomfortably long time. Vesper understands, in some capacity, my conflict, and eventually turns away to show me her back again. I quietly resume the massage by using my fingertips to redistribute the pressure to her entire upper back until someone I vaguely recognize lets themselves into our unit. Hey gang, just wanted to let you know there's going to be an assembly after breakfast and that everyone is encouraged to attend. Don't be late. Ah, thanks, Mozzie. Vesper purrs as I finesse the last of her needless strain away. <laughs> Wait a minute. Mozzie. That's what her name is, not Maxine. Uh, Mozzie. Mozzie. Who names their kid Mozzie? Thanks, Mozzie, I repeat, more so to make sure I don't forget her name again than to actually impart any gratitude. Regardless, she hollers back a, you're welcome, on her way to the mess hall, the sound distorted by the waves breaking against the echo-prone peaks of the mountain. Well, Annabelle, thank you very much for the massage, but I think I'm going to get some grub, Vesper says as she gets back to her feet. Once she's firmly planted and facing me, she adds, care to join me? Breakfast comes and goes quickly. The more rambunctious rumblers require caffeine this early in the morning to be so brazenly boisterous, and breakfast isn't really Giswan's strong suit, so there isn't much going on there either. The coffee was a highlight, though. Like last night, Mozzie, Vesper, and I secure a table together, but this time I make an effort to live in the moment and get a read on Mozzie. Mozzie's a bit... <laughs> difficult to figure out, but she and Vesper seem to have found a lot of common ground in their fascination with small critters. Mozzie is a huge fan of insects, particularly ones with long, skinny legs. I tune in and doubt occasionally because some of the anatomical principles she dotes on would scare the color out of me if there were on any bugs I've encountered, but the unbridled passion and bombast with which she recollects all her chance encounters with creepy crawlies is a certain kind of infectious. Between sips of coffee, she's going on tangents about how she rates bugs on the intensity of their big thorax energy, whatever the hell that means, and by the time she's gasping for air, Vesper and I are nodding along with her. And then Vesper will pick up where she left off and talk about frogs instead. She talks about their webbing, and sticky toes, and long tongues, and eyeballs, and then I remember that Vesper is a weirdo too because she drifts into how frogs go into goober mode, and I don't have the energy to come to an understanding of it, but they're both giggling, so I start giggling too. And then there's a lull in the conversation, and both Vesper and Mozzie are looking at me, non-verbally passing the baton to let me go on a tangent. But I don't really know where to go with the conversation, because I realize that I wasn't really in it to begin with. A few beats pass, and the conversation rolls back into frogs eating bugs and how tragic it is, but I'm not really engaged anymore. By the time I finish my coffee and grits, people are queuing their way into the practice arena where Bill typically hosts assemblies. I eventually pick out Bill from the crowd as he works his way to the bow of the gathering. Once everyone is in place, we get comfortable and sit down, some people creating stone stools while others simply cross their legs on the floor. All the while, Bill elevates himself half a meter on a stone column and clears his throat. <clears> throat> Good morning, everyone. 
Sorry I didn't join you for dinner last night. With such an intense competition, I felt our typical rule of losers tidying up would be cruel. Such steaks work up an appetite, you know. Bill identifies Rosie in the crowd as she begins to speak up. Well, I'm glad you did that. You really didn't have to. No, no, Bill assures. I'm glad you got to cool down in the presence of your fellow rumblers and share a good meal. It was nice, Rosie confirms. You should have been there. Well, from the sound of it, I didn't miss out on too much, Bill says. Which is good news, because if any bets or wagers were placed, I'd have to have been sure to stamp them out as they have no place among us. He says this with a rolling, knowing inflection, and you can tell how closely people sat to Skylar and Yogev last night based on how angry their otherwise polite laughter sounds. I get a glance of Yogev trying to play it cool and laughing along, while Skylar is blushing too hard to deny any plausibility. Bill prepares to change the subject, so it seems they're off the hook for this one. But, yes, I appreciate your concern about why I didn't show up last night. I was busy tidying up, but it was thanks to one of you that I was able to enjoy my meal while it was still warm. You know who you are. Thank you. While Vesper and Bill look at me, everyone else looks at Gaswan, who's lurking next to a pillar someone made who couldn't quite get a handle on how a few others made shorter stools with a modification of the technique. It was during that meal that I had an epiphany, Bill continues. As you all know, the charter that legitimizes sanctuary is tenuous, at best, and preserving sanctuary status is an ongoing struggle. It's required a lot of me to keep the bustle and representatives happy without compromising on the way of life I'm providing here, and a lot of working around them to make sure that we, as a community, can secure the basics. While Yogev and Rosie have done their best to represent us well to the inquiring citizens and press that have come to see these matches, I'd like to take a moment to instead thank all of you who have volunteered to help me keep track of all of the infrastructure and maintenance required to keep us afloat. Bill starts picking out faces of the assembly and more pointedly expressing gratitude, rattling off things like, Every private space made, every walkway given rails, every word of mouth spread. And then he picks out my face. Every frenzied trip to the marketplace, all of it. Once Bill finishes his verbal accolades, everyone cheers and claps, and it hits me that even though I'm not ducking discs and chucking rocks, I've been doing my part, and that it matters. Maybe I'm not bringing in any revenue with cool shows or competition, but even the mundane things, like helping him budget out meals or burying down to buy them, were critical. Uh, uh. I sit on it for a moment longer, and while I don't like the idea that he wants to keep me around simply because I'm good at running errands, it helps soften my previous rationalization that I was wasting space. And that's enough for now, I decide. I think I hate him less. That is, until he kept talking. We've reached a point where I feel comfortable leaving some of the responsibilities I've taken care of in the past to our outstanding members here, such as coordinating matches and marketing tickets. That's why I wanted to gather everyone here to tell you who to reach out to for certain issues first, as I'll be much more busy satisfying my other obligations to Sanctuary that aren't as closely related to the day-to-day -day goings on here. So, without further ado, all things rumbles and bracketeering, I'm leaving to our recently crowned Basilum Rumble champion, Yogev! <laughs> Seriously? Yogev? That bonehead that can't keep himself out of Skylar's stupid schemes? Hey, he's the one I have to learn to rumble from? I know he's good in a fight, but come on, Bill. Did one of those stray structures from yesterday hit you on the head or something? Because I think it's affecting your judgment. Then, suddenly, everyone is looking at me. I'm the only one on my feet. Pointing at Bill. Ugh, did I say all of that out loud? Is that how you feel about things? He asks, head turned. Fuck me, I really did. Uh, um... I stammer, depleted of the moxie that leaked out of me. Can we have a moment? He asks, rolling his head forwards and hand back, goading me over to him. I'm slow to approach, but follow his lead, and once I'm close to his column, Silt shoots up from beneath and behind me. There's now a large, tall stretch of stone between me and the crowd, and I'm on a platform high enough to bring me eye to eye with him. His eyes are gentle, curious, and bear a small measure of what is perhaps guilt? Equally subtle is the angstrom of surprise. <sighs> he wasn't expecting me to stay. Uh, we've got that much in common. I wasn't either. Really, Yogev? I interrogate, no longer angry, but instead baffled and disappointed. Is this really about him? Weren't you the one asking him about his moves when you first started watching our matches? 
Well, that was before I realized he was such an airhead, I claim, already losing steam in my argument. I understand you're disappointed, Bill says, but I'll try my best to make it up to you. Yogev, as the champion, is a natural pick to train those who already have Rumble-adjacent experience and only need to hone their edge, but my plan was never to leave you to him. Our columns slide beside each other and Bill jets out both of his hands, sending forth an energy that perforates the large stretch of earth into vertical rectangles. He then brings one hand beneath the other, and the chunk he had put the most energy into now follows where he leads. He lifts the wall up, and I see Rosie, who had her arms folded waiting for our conversation to be over, clock a cue from Bill before entering through the opening he made. Once she's on our side, Bill lowers the wall back down and joins it with the ground and blockade. Did you tell her yet? Rosie asks. Tell me what? I ponder. Bill lowers all of us to the ground and places a hand on both of our shoulders. Since Yogev is a bit more... advanced, and we haven't been able to get another batch of refugees for me to train, Rosie has volunteered to get you up to speed. Just the two of you. I look at Rosie, her dense, wavy hair gallivanting on the breezy gust funneled by Bill's structures, and find an earnestly eager gaze. I've never met someone who's dodged the itch and still shake the earth like you, she says. I'm hoping it's nurture, not nature. If I can figure out your trick, I've got a thing or two to learn from this as well. I look at her calloused hands and weathered fingernails and know they are the way they are because Rosie has put in just as much time as Yogev has. But with her, it hasn't gone to her head. I'm not too stoked about the plan changing, I tell Bill, shrugging off his hand before returning to face Rosie. But I think this will do. 